Each of us has a unique career story to tell. For some, these fly high like rocket launches. For others, they're more like the game of shoots and ladders, with advances and setbacks along the way. Either way, we learn countless lessons from these experiences. And that's what we put into the spotlight here at Career Sessions Career Lessons. Join discussions featuring a variety of guests sharing their stories of ups and downs, as well as the secrets of their success and what drives them to continue moving forward. We break down the tools and resources that will help you establish your dream career and realize your professional goals. Here's your host, J.R. Lowry. Hi, I'm J.R. Lowry, and this is Career Sessions, Career Lessons, which is brought to you by Pathwise.io. Pathwise is dedicated to helping you live the career you deserve, providing career coaching, content, courses, and community. Basic membership is free, so visit Pathwise.io and join today. Today, my guest is Wendy Smith. Wendy is the Dana J. Johnson Professor of Management and the Faculty Director of the Women's Leadership Initiative at the Lerner College of Business and Economics at the University of Delaware, where she has worked for the past 17 years. She has earned a number of awards for her research, including the most cited paper in the past 10 years and the Decade Award. Wendy obtained her PhD in organizational behavior at Harvard Business School, where she first began investigating paradoxes. Her work focuses on strategies that leaders and senior teams can employ to effectively respond to opposing and often contradicting challenges. She also spent time as a research fellow at the University of Cambridge and has a bachelor's degree in psychology and political science from Yale University. Wendy, welcome. Thanks for doing the show with me today. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. I uh, appreciate you doing this, especially given that it's very early in the morning for you uh, in Sydney, Australia, uh, as I record here in the evening in London. Um, let's let's start with your book, Both and Thinking, um, which you published last year. Can you give the audience a brief overview of your book? Yes. Here's the bottom line. Just okay. to jump right in. in this book, we, myself and my co-author and longtime uh, colleague, Marianne Lewis, argue that we all face tensions, competing demands, challenges every day in our lives from the small minuscule challenges to the large strategic uh, tensions that we feel in our organizations. It's not if we face tensions, but how. So this right. book is an exploration into the nature of the tensions we experience and how we can use them to be productive rather than stumble over them. So you you mentioned that you and Marianne have known each other for a long time. Uh, how did the two of you first meet and what prompted you to decide to write the book together? Well, I like to say that I stalked her. She doesn't okay. always uh, agree with that verb. And she, uh, I was doing my PhD. I was at Harvard Business School. I was exploring this idea of paradox, which right. is the underlying concept that informs how we think about tensions. There weren't a lot of people writing about paradox in organizational behavior, organizational theory, leadership. She had just written a brilliant paper that was published in our top journal and then won the award for best paper of the year. I read that paper and thought, I want to know everything this woman knows. And so I emailed her and said, can, can we please meet at our conference? We met and we like to say the rest is history. We just started talking and there was just so many cool ideas that started to emerge from that. So I am a huge fan of the value of reaching out to people, particularly when you are interested in things they're interested in and yeah. inviting them to the conversation. Yeah, well, I mean, that's basically how the two of us got connected. You know, I reached out to you because I was interested in and the work that you were doing, and here we are. So um, I'm curious to hear, how's the book been received? What's surprised you positively or negatively about, about this post-publishing time period that you've had since last fall? Uh, maybe the most exciting part is that it has been really fun. Uh, writing a book is really vulnerable. It, it really mm. does. You're bearing your soul to the world because if you write a good book, then you really are sharing something that's very important to you. And that's a really vulnerable task. And to have people read it and say, oh my goodness, this really impacted a decision that I was making, or it has shifted the way that I lead my team, or uh, yeah. it has impacted, you know, for Marianne, she shared it. She She's the dean of her business school and shared it with the entire administration of the university. And they have qualitatively shifted the way that they have conversations about the way the university runs 
Wow, that is really empowering. So so I'm so grateful to anyone who's reached back to us and said, my goodness, this is how it has impacted us. And by the way, this goes back to your last question. People don't often reach back because they think authors are busy, but oh my yeah. goodness, when we get emails like that that say, here is how this book has, has shifted my thinking or impacted a decision, uh, we are so grateful. So I encountered both and thinking through Dolly Chu. I don't know if you know her. She's a professor at the um, NYU. Um, she and I were classmates uh, at business school. And so I interviewed her. I had, was reading one of her books. She mentioned both and thinking. I kind of went down that rabbit hole. And, you know, that was for me, it was like, oh, that's like such a simple concept, but it's so powerful in its simplicity. Well, we share that as well. Dolly and I were classmates in our PhD programs. And so- oh, yeah. uh, uh, it has been really fun to, and, and actually there too, I think, lies power. It's been fun to publish books together and learn together about the this world of publishing, particularly when you are an academic and mostly publishing academic papers. This yeah. is a whole new world. And so I am grateful to her and grateful that, well, grateful to the work that she does broadly in thinking about how we think about diversity, how we think about inclusion, how we think about, um, in her recent book, uh, navigating the challenges of having both a difficult history, yeah. particularly in the United States, and being able to be very proud of our country and how she has integrated this concept of both and showing us that it's really valuable yeah. in that very important space. Yeah, I mean, it really is a, a good way of explaining pretty much any country's history, right? You know, yeah. there there are things that are, you know, great and horrific about the history of pretty much any country on the planet. And, you know, all of us as citizens of our respective countries have to kind of make peace with that. And, you know, she's uh, she gave a, a you know a compelling argument for how to do that in, in her most recent book. So I found it I found it really interesting. You mentioned that I'm here in Sydney, Australia. One of the pieces that I am exploring or that I have uh, been opening my eyes to is the history here in Australia and the relationship yeah. between you know the white man and the colon as a colonizer and the indigenous people in Australia and how that yeah. conversation happening right now. So indeed, it is a very powerful and challenging conversation. Yeah. I mean, certainly there are parallels there with the situation in the United States with Native Americans and, um, you know, a, a troubling history that I think, you know, Australia at least is right now trying to come to its own, you know, sort of peace with. So you, you mentioned a minute ago that you started, uh, studying paradoxes when you were working on your PhD. What was it that piqued your interest in that topic in the first place? You know, I could take that question in two directions. So okay. um, sort of professionally, if you will, or from a research topic, uh, what I was uh, working with um, IBM, top management teams at IBM studying innovation. And the question that they were grappling with, with the question that from a uh, research point of view that um, that we had studied around innovation is how do you not get stuck in the past in order to move to the future? And when I was studying these top management teams at IBM that were grappling with innovation, that's not the question that they were really grappling with. The question that they were grappling with is how do I move to the future knowing that I still have to hold on to my existing customers, products, or what have right. you. So it's not how do I move quickly to the future? It's how do I live in the future, manage to innovate while simultaneously living in my existing world? And, you know, when I spoke to, for example, Janet Perna, who was the general manager of their database management um, solutions, she would say, look, I, I have to wear two hats. So th that is be focused on all this new stuff and make sure that all of my operations were successful. So, so that was the paradoxical challenge the today and tomorrow that I was looking at in my research. Yeah. That said, and I know that some of the conversations that you have in this podcast are around careers and career management. In the book, uh, we say, I remember one of my advisors, uh, Richard Hackman, who is a brilliant, was a brilliant scholar around teams. He would always say, research is me search, that particularly in the social sciences, we tend to study ourselves. I was grappling with my own career decisions, dilemmas, tensions, where I was in this space where it felt like I was in these contrasting demands that I felt like I had to make a choice between them. So it started with, do I want to be an academic 
uh, who studies ideas, or do I want to be what academics like to call practitioners, a leader, like some yeah. amorphous person who actually does stuff. And it felt like that was an either or that I had to choose between, you know, and then when I went into academia and was studying academia, I was studying innovation, but I went into academia at the time soon after uh, there were all of these massive ethical collapses or massive collapses of organizations like Enron and WorldCom right. because of ethical lapses. And at the same time, I, you know, I had grown up at the era of seeing Ben and Jerry's and the body shop trying to change the conversation into what is the social responsibility of corporations. And so the other big challenge was I have all this amazing access to study innovation at IBM. And I think I'm really interested in this question around sustainability, social responsibility, like that felt like an either or. So, hmm. so this notion of paradox, whether it was applied to my research on do I focus on the, the future or the present today or tomorrow in the innovation space or my own, you know, personal professional, you know, personal career challenges? How do I think about what am I doing in my career? How do I think about what I'm studying? Those all felt like they were competing demands that felt really weighty and demanding on me. And paradox became a concept that both helped me think about my research and helped me think about my own decisions. Yeah, which makes a lot of sense. Out of curiosity, I mean, you must have had some sort of academic overlap in discussions with Clayton Christensen, given the work that, you know, that he did on innovation and, you know, the the, the innovator's dilemma and the, the challenge, the tension that, you know, companies who are incumbents feel in terms of having to disrupt themselves. I did. I'm grateful to have been in a playground of brilliant academics. So yeah. I think, uh, Clay Christensen and his work on the innovator's dilemma. My advisor was Mike Tushman, who did a lot of work on what um, was framed around this notion of being ambidextrous, which again mm -hmm. is being able to create the conditions in your company that you can have innovation, be a corporate innovator, corporate explorer is the word that he and uh, some of his colleagues are using now while simultaneously make sure that the wheels are still running. So yeah. I was in a playground of brilliant. I, I will also just call out, you know, two other amazing mentors. I, I had on my committee, Amy Edmondson, who many of sure. your listeners might know as the psychological safety. How do you create the conditions where people speak up and make sure that they're sharing what's going on so that you can learn together while simultaneously performing? And I'll just also add in somebody that, that may not be as familiar to your audience, but the brilliant Harvard psychologist, Ellen Langer, who wrote a mm -hmm. book on mindfulness in the 1980s to remind us of how do we both remain mindful in the moment uh, this is sort of pre-Zen um, meditative John Kabat-Zinn mindfulness, but yeah. her definition of mindfulness of constantly noticing novel distinctions in service of letting ourselves be really um, present. So, yeah. yeah, I'm grateful to many mentors. Yeah, a lot of great minds there, that's for sure. The world is full of paradoxes. We all know this intellectually, and yet we all suffer from either or thinking. Why is it that we fall into that trap? Well, first I'll start with, we all know this, which is, I love that you say that. Uh, for the first, I can't tell you how many years, and even still today, uh, there are many folks that want to relegate this word paradox to the world of the like philosophers and logicians and, and don't want to recognize it as something that we experience in our social life because it's challenging and um, because it brings up this kind of confusing idea. So for many, many years, I actually spent the first part of my career convincing my colleagues in the social sciences, in organizational theory, that this is a concept that really does apply to the, to the tensions and experiences that we experience. So, so I'll just start there. And, and, and just for the sake of your listeners, I'll just say that to me, the word paradox, what it means is that there are these opposing ideas that are not just in opposition with one another, they're also interdependent. They define, they reinforce one another, they persist over time so that we're not trying to solve them or resolve them, we're trying to live with them. And, and they underlie every single one of our decisions. So they underlie, you know, a decision of what should I have for breakfast? Should I have that 
beautiful uh, almond croissant or chocolate croissant, or should I go for the green smoothie? So do I go for discipline or do I go for something that's sort of momentary pleasure or long-term discipline? And so the Mm. long-term or the short-term, the disciplined or the pleasure, the, you know, the self and other today and tomorrow, these are the tensions that underlie every one of our decisions. And if we stop and look at any of our decisions, and pull them back, we'll see these paradoxes. So, yeah. so that's what we mean. I think that some people want to say, no, no, the world is not paradoxical. It's much more clear cut. There is a single truth in the world that we don't live in this duality because it's complex and confusing. And 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 so very briefly, why do we go back to either or thinking, which we all do, and it's supernatural mm. because it's so much easier. It's really complex to sit in a world where there's multiple truths that are opposing one another and say they are both true. I mean, I'll think about this just in terms of a conversation I had with my husband just a couple of nights ago, where yeah. again, we had to remind ourselves that he has a point of view that, you know, and I like to say my husband and I are really aligned when it comes to the big picture of how we parent and how we partner. But we have some real differences in the nuance of specifics like bedtime. Mm. And then we get these conversations where he'll, you know, he's a little more permissive on bedtime and I like to be a little more disciplined around it. And now that we have 16 year olds, it's kind of a moot point, but, but the point being that we get into these conversations where it feels like we have these opposing ideas and one of us has to be right. And the other has to be wrong. And it is emotionally hard to sit back into that space and say, wait, maybe there is a space where we're both right. Yeah. And that's hard for people you know, physiologically, we're wired to make decisions, right? Um, Sometimes snap decisions, you know, in in the interest of survival. And, you know, we want to judge people as being either this or that. And, you know, we're all a little bit of this and that. And, you know, I think that's the part that, that kind of goes against that, that wiring, right? You know, the part of our brain that, you know, that, that sort of makes those flight or fight, friend or foe kind of decisions that that we all have to, you know, had to rely on at one point in human evolution. I think that's right. I've been um, really intrigued by a broader conversation exactly to this point, which is how do we move beyond the mammalian brain that has these quick thoughts and invite ourselves to pause and take a deep breath and think about something in a more complex, collaborative, you know, manner that, and, and, Paradox and thinking about both and falls into that category. It requires us to step back from the gut response to categorize, put something in a box and and leave it there and then choose between opposing ideas. And by the way, the other pressure we have is to be consistent and our culture reinforces that need to be consistent. You know, it's, it's also invites us to pause and say, wait, is there something more complex? Can I look at this in a different way? You use some colorful uh, metaphors in the book. We won't have time to get into all of them, but one I think that builds on what we were just talking about. You've got the the mules, right, in sort of this integrative, you know, thinking, and then you've got tightrope walkers who are constantly balancing. It'd be great if you could maybe just elaborate on on you know both of those and how they fit into the framework of of both and thinking. Yeah, you know, I think when people think about both and, they tend to go to this place that there is this perfect win-win. And and that's what we call the mule. The mule is the one of the oldest biological hybrids that man has bred. It's the stronger than a horse, smarter than a donkey, bring them together and you have this biologically smarter, stronger beast. And uh, we've been breeding them for 3000 years. And that's this ideal win-win. And one of the things that I learned actually from my dissertation, from my IBM study, is that when we go to the both and space, we think, oh, there's going to be this ideal win-win. And that doesn't happen all the time. So in IBM, I went to go study these top management teams as they're making decisions. And I thought, oh, they're going to find all these places where they can bring their existing products and existing customers into their innovative space. And there's this better possibility. And that's not what happened. And in fact, the example I use in the book is more of a personal example, which is what happened when I first had my kids. So my 16-year-olds, I have three kids, but my 16-year-olds were my first kids and they're twins. 
And I remember when I first became a mom and I'm tired and exhausted and I'm going back to work and I'm thinking, gosh, like I study this both and thing. There's got to be a better space where I'm not feeling torn all the time between this either or of work versus versus home and my kids. And I remember thinking, yeah, there is like the ideal both and is that I open a daycare down the street, work becomes life, life becomes work. You know, I don't have to worry about leaving my kids in the morning and I don't have to worry about bringing work home at night. And that's lovely. And I know people who have done that and that would never be me. So the idea is that there are these mules, there are these ideal, we call them creative integrations. They happen, but they don't happen all the time. Yeah. And we argue that another way to live in the both and is what we label as being consistently inconsistent. And that is what the IBM senior teams were doing. That was what I found as a big aha in that study. That is what I did as a new mom and still do uh, in work and life. And many of us do in work and life, which is to, you know, as you said, the metaphors live on the tightrope which is that we live with these competing demands. And sometimes we make decisions that focus on one of them and sometimes the other over time. And so it's about looking at our decisions, not at any specific moment, but the broad over time. And that over time, we're making decisions between the two, making these micro shifting oscillations so that At some moment, I might be home with my family for dinner, but the next night I'm finishing a work project. But the idea is is that we're not overemphasizing one or the other so that we fall off the tightrope. We are balancing in these micro decisions. So it's not that I am making decisions that I am so committed to work that I have no time for my family. I'm starting to burn out. They have no connection to me. Things are going awry at home, but rather that I'm making these micro oscillations and living in that space can feel a little dizzying. It's hard to live on the tightrope. And at the same time, it can also be empowering when we think about in the big picture, we're trying to get to the other side of the tightrope, which is our long-term calming vision that encompasses our competing demands. And, and then you go on to talk about a toolkit that you can use in uh, you know, sort of building your ability to, to think more in a both-and fashion, assumptions, boundaries, Comfort dynamism, nice, easy ABCD uh, framework to remember. Can you give us an overview of of how all of that comes together in that toolkit? Yes. And I love that you said that because JR, I'll just tell you that writing the book, it took us quite some time to get to ABCD. So uh, so I love that. And um we what we the reason we wrote this book is because, as you said earlier, people accept that there's paradoxes. The question is how. And that right. is the world that we see ourselves in. And we are so grateful to have so many amazing academic colleagues that are now studying, how do you do this thing? So we saw this book as bringing together that research to how do you do this thing and to help people realize that there's, that it's not just one. So so there's, we can talk about what, what might be the first step in, but it's, there's multiple tools and they work together. And, and very briefly, we think about the tools as what do I need to do as an individual to inform how I think about both and thinking and how can I change or what are the things that the system or the context can do to help inform both and thinking. So A and C are about assumptions. How do I change my mindset, my thinking? And C is comfort. How do I navigate my emotions around this? Because this is emotional. I get anxious, I get defensive, I get fearful, I get resistant. And that is what brings me back into either or. So so head and heart, how do I change my, my, my thinking and my emotions? And then B and D are how do I create the context around me to scaffold decision-making process? So B is, we, we call it boundaries. It's the structures that we put into place to enable us to think both and. And then D is dynamism or the practices that allow us to continually shift and change over time. Uh, I'll just say, and, and, and we then do a deep dive into each of these of what would that look like? And I'm happy to unpack a little more, but I just want to say it as a big picture, one of the refrains that we repeat in the book multiple times is the idea that navigating paradox is paradoxical. 
And what we mean by that is that sometimes when people talk about change, they say, oh, in order for something to change, the individuals have to change. We have to change the way people think about things. We have to change the way they experience things. No, the system has to change. We have to change the way the system structures things. And this is a conversation, for example, in the space around women and women's leadership. Do we change the women or do we change the system around diversity? Do we change... And we say, no, it's both. It's both the individual and the system, even though sometimes those are at odds with each other. And, you know, people will say head or heart. Is it, you know, it's both. And then, you know, in the system, is it about the things that we can structure and and schedule and plan? And or is it the things that are changing along the way? Well, it's stability and change. So embedded into this idea are these four tools. They work together together. And they are inherently paradoxical in helping us navigate paradox. You talked a little bit about some of the challenges that people will face in this. Maybe talk about, you know, let's go a little bit deeper on some of the challenges that that women will face, right? And where, yeah, I know you you lead the Women's Leadership Initiative um, back in the U.S. at, at uh, the University of Delaware. You know, what are the kinds of challenges apart from the obvious one of, you know, being a working mom just in general is is a tightrope act all the time. Uh, what are some of the other things that you know that you tend to uh, work with women on that are kind of an either or and both and? Yeah, so I do. I lead a women's leadership initiative. One of the things that we do, I know many of the people listening to this are sort of mid-career. They're thinking about their next steps. Part of what we do is focused on our students at the university. And part of what we do is focused on women at that mid-career level where, you know, I know the metaphor is hitting the glass ceiling. And I know that's been contested. But the idea is how do we help women move from that mid-career space into their next adventure, whether it's into the C-suite or into entrepreneurship or what have you. One of the interesting conversations that we had when we launched this initiative is, you know, you're trying to advance conversations about inclusion and diversity, but you're being exclusive in order to do it. And mm. there, you know, I, I just had a conversation the other day with a colleague who uh, is from New Zealand and came over and was here in Sydney and we had lunch. And she said, we had conversations with our colleagues, uh, you know, smaller conversations around with women around the table. And some of the male colleagues say, well, why, why do we have to be excluded from those conversations? And so that is a really, I think, important conversation to address, which is, there too is a both and. We both need spaces where we can uh, engage with people who share our identity to reinforce and, and provide the power and context and support so that we can be in conversations with people who don't and then engage more broadly. And I think this is where the power of employee resource groups come in and the power of being able to both find people who are similar to you that you can feel like you can connect to in a different way in service of, in order to enable us to connect with people that are different from us. So I think there's an important conversation here about how we navigate diversity in both of those spaces. Look, it is a balancing act, right? You know, the, the topic of diversity, because to your point, you don't want to do it in a way that, you know, becomes exclusive in the other direction. And, you know, I, I mean, you're seeing even some legal challenges to that going on today and in, in the U.S. in particular, as as there's a little bit of a, I'll say, a, a backlash, you know, against the, the push that's been made on diversity. It's it's challenging. Right. I mean, there's ample evidence to point that there's significant benefit from having more diversity in your organization. Um, and yet it's hard to really make it happen. Right. And to do it in a way that doesn't have the pendulum swing, you know, or that that tightrope, you know, uh, pole that you're holding on to, you know, go too far in one direction or the other. That's right. And, you know, to bring us back to both. And I think we, we call that the wrecking ball, a vicious mm. cycle of the wrecking ball where you swing from one end and swing back to the other. And to bring us back to the both. And one of the tools that we say is really important is what's your broader goal? So the idea here is we're not trying to create space that is distinct in service of holding people out and advancing just one minority group. The bigger goal is that we're trying to do it in service of creating a more diverse and integrated culture. So I think it's the same thing that 
I, you know, I am a strong proponent that men need space to be with men to talk about the issue of how they could engage more effectively in a diverse conversation. I am a huge fan of work by David Smith and Brad Johnson that advocate for how men can be better allies. Well, that's really different than men need space to be with men so that they can stand in a locker room and and uh, offer up awful jokes about women, right? So it's not just men need space to be with men, In period. It's men need space to be with men in service of this broader goal. Women need space to be with women in service of being able to come back together and know how to work in a more, diverse, you know, the same thing across race, the same thing across, you know, other, you know, other kinds of identities where it's not in service of advancing one minority group or one group against the other, it's in service of being able to come back together in a more inclusive space. Coming back to career related topics more generally, um, you talk about some of these in the book, right? That, you know, the, the decision between, you know, staying with a company in a role you're in versus going to another company. When you think about some of the either or kinds of situations that we're all presented with and and how we can turn them into you know more both and situations. What are, what are the what are the big career ones that come to mind for you? Gosh, there's so many. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think one of the things about our careers is how quickly we, um, starting from when we're kids, get stuck in assuming that our career is a total identity, and that we mm. go down again. The other vicious cycle we talk about uh, of either oring is what we call a rabbit hole. We go down a rabbit hole, meaning that. We take on label, we take on expertise, our expertise is reinforcing, we connect with a broader community of people that reinforce that expertise. And the next thing you know, we can't pop up and make change or see alternatives. And so you you were saying, I run this women's leadership initiative. And one thing that I've done as part of it is uh, do a season of a podcast with some amazing female leaders. And one of my favorite conversations was with a woman, or I, there's a lot of favorite conversations, but I had a great conversation with a woman named Tabassum Salam, who is a, an administrator at um, a massive, a major hospital in the United States. As a doctor, uh, you become incredibly entrenched in an identity around medicine. And the question that she asked herself was, is there a way for me to have broader reach in the medical world by jumping into and taking on more leadership roles. Well, in order to do that, she was going to go back and get her MBA, but she couldn't even fathom going back to school, rethinking her identity as a medical professional. You know, here she was, medicine is about the one-on-one relationship with the patient and really had to have a support team around her, her husband in particular, say, you know what, you're really excited about this. We'll support you. Go back to school, try this out. And this does not deny your commitment to medicine. It expands it. But just thinking about what would that look like to shift is so scary for some people um, Mm. that we don't do it. We just stick with what we know uh, because it's scary both emotionally to think about a different identity and taking the time to do it. it strikes me that there's a you know a linkage you know in the example you just gave is an example of that to all of the work that's been done on change and why people struggle so much with you know letting go of one thing and uh you know trying to embrace something else or you know and maybe having you know the thinking that would allow them to you know do a bit of having their cake and eating it too. Yeah, we tie this to um, the idea of an S-curve, which is a popular framework in innovation. And the yeah. S-curve, is over time, you can imagine an S where you have a new idea and it takes some time to really sort of gain some traction and then quickly gains traction and performance, but at some point falls off the edge and is no longer relevant. And the argument in the innovation space is you want to start exploring your next S-curve before you fall off the end of that first S-curve. But people tend to take this, like, if it ain't broke, don't fix it mentality. And so you only really have the motivation to look to the new S-curve when you're actually falling down, but that's too late. So, So the idea, and that's true in your company, that's true in your entrepreneurial venture, that's true in your career, which is that the time where you have the most resources, power, and is valuable to explore the S-curve is when you're at the top of your, you're the peak of what you're doing. Okay. Well, if you're at the right. peak of what you're doing, you have no motivation to look to the next 
S-curve or the new innovation or the new thing you're going to do professionally. And so here is the paradox, if you will, of learning and performing or in our mm. careers being both heads down in what we're trying to do and heads up and looking to the next thing, the next possibility. Or, yeah. you know, this is where I think back to Amy Edmondson's work on psychological safety in teams, which is being able to perf- to to learn effectively, fail, try new things in service of, and at the same time, to enable ourselves to perform well. So, you know, you can think about that feeling of that tug of war of what it means to be heads down, heads up, learning and performing, trying new things while being at the top of your game. That tension there is sort of a, you know, embedded tension that we experience. So that, that's paradox right there. It is. And, you know, certainly the adage of it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, you know, is very common in the, in the business world because, you know, in the near term, it's a safer bet to just keep doing what you're doing. And, and what, what's always interested me is, you know, how many companies, the leaders are thinking about their own time horizons more than they're yeah. thinking about the company, right? And they're thinking, I can ride this for another three to five years. I don't have to do anything radically different. You know, I'll get out on top. The company has a crash, you know, after they leave because they haven't done anything really to prepare it for that next desk curve, Right. And, you know, that's a very successful strategy for a very short period of time. I mean, I know you do asset management and, you know, you're thinking about companies and the question is, what is an indicator of a great company? It's a great leader who Mm. is thinking about, is constantly looking out to the horizon and thinking about the long term outside of their leadership, right? There, there's an indicator that you've got great leadership, willing to take risks, willing to explore, willing to see beyond just their own needs, just their own self goals. The timing is the challenge, right? I mean, that's the art of this whole thing is when do you start tearing down? When do you start diverting attention, you know, to build the next version, right? To hit that next S curve, you know, it's, 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 an art to know when to do that, right? Which by definition means it's impossible to do it perfectly. But, you know, that that's one of the bigger challenges, I think that, you know, leaders, particularly in a world now that's, you know, more volatile, more uncertain, moving more quickly, you know, than probably we've ever seen, you know, it's, it's a decision you're constantly wrestling with as a leader. One of the opportunities there is making sure that you have good people around you to advise you on that and that you're listening to them, that you're not ignoring them. Um, In the book, we uh, feature a good friend and colleague of mine, Jeremy Hockenstein, who was starting a social enterprise when I was doing my PhD. And I watched and I studied this social enterprise. It's called Digital Divide Data. And it's an amazing organization that started in Cambodia as a work integration organization. And uh, they're now 20 something years into this venture and he's still their CEO. And as one, you know, this is rare that founding CEOs stay with the organization because they're so passionate about the ideas that they're not able to make the transition between early startup mentality that's exciting to get something going and being able to have something more stable and expansive and operationally efficient. And Jeremy has this wonderful line where he said, you know, early on, he brought on a board to advise him and he had to listen to their advice. And what he knew is that his job changed every six months, the ways in which he had to operate. And sometimes he was ahead of that curve and able to sort of see the change and anticipate it. And sometimes he was behind that curve and had to sort of catch up as a leader. But he had to be dynamic in how he saw his job changing. One of the ways to do that was to be able to or to listen, to to bring on advisors that he trusted and to ask them, how does my job change? What do I need to do? And to listen to some of their advice along the way in order to do that. And so that's not easy. No, it's not easy. And to your point, I mean, it's, it's a rare founder, it's a rare CEO in general that can be in the role for that long, um, you know, that's willing to do enough reinvention and enough personal growth and enough corporate growth and change that, you know, that they go through those time periods and, you know, don't get stuck in their ways. It's, it's just, it's a very difficult thing, which is why most companies, you know, typically want to change their CEOs every five years or so. 
I'll just say, you know, we said research is me search. As you noted, I am here yeah. in Sydney on sabbatical. And at this wonderful moment where our book just came out, and the question is, what's next? And it is a really provocative and emotionally challenging question to yeah. ask on the way. And I am grateful to great advisors. Uh, but that is a real, you know, you asked about career decisions. One is what what is out there. But the next is, wow, I have achieved something. What's next is also a really hard question to ask. Is is that a conversation that you are having with Marianne or is it a conversation more that you're thinking about on your own? It's a conversation I'm having with anyone who will have it with me. <laughs> <laughs> I am curious to hear how people think about their own what's next and inform my own thinking. So how are you thinking about that right now? Well, I mean, I think the exciting piece is um, it goes back to this idea of experimentation. So uh, I'm not sure. I mean, next could be a next book. Next could be a leadership role. Marianne is a dean at, the, at a university, a leadership role at a university. It could be more leadership within um, our broader um, industry of academia. And so I am learning from the idea of learning as experimentation mm -hmm. so that in the S-curve process, it's not like it looks so nice and neat. You have one S curve and you jump to the next, but actually what happens in this learning process is that you have one S curve and then you're in this almost funnel where you're putting, you're trying all kinds of different things so that something eventually comes through the other end. And so that when, and that's the idea of, you know, that's what experimentation looks like is that you're not just jumping to the next S curve. You're trying all these different possibilities so that when you're ready to make that jump, you have set out these possibilities along the way. So to me, it's yeah. a bit of moving into that experimentation of different options and being okay that I'm not sure which one will come through the other end of the funnel. And so JR, when we have a conversation on your podcast a couple of years from now, I'll come back and report what came through the other end of that funnel. Yeah, fair enough. I'm curious back, you know, when you were an undergraduate at Yale, what did you what did you foresee yourself doing, you know, when you were in your college days? That is such a good question. Uh, that, too, was the start of me feeling like I had to make very clear decisions and not be experimental. So hmm. I'll just say I'm a huge fan of being able to be in your college years and experiment and try out different opportunities. I uh, Yesterday, I, I took my daughter, we went to go see the TEDx Sydney stage, okay. super fun. And one of the speakers was talking about how do you get jobs now, and was talking about the value of experimentation, uh, meaning wh whether it's sort of trying out different jobs or trying out different internships and different volunteer roles so that you can get experience so that you're not coming to the table without just different experiences. His his main question was people are so curious, what's my what's my job? What's my profession? And uh they don't try out enough jobs to get themselves into the job that they love. And and so that experimentation, but that's not what, you know, when I was in college, I felt this pressure to know. And I was so jealous of my pre-med friends because what they had was clear certainty of a path of how to get from where they were their freshman year of college to their profession all laid out for them. Now, some of them felt really constrained by that path, and, but I actually jumped into being a pre-med partially because I had a friend whose dad was an orthopedic surgeon and wanted, all, wanted us both to be orthopedic surgeons, and yeah. partially because there was a certain comfort in the certainty that pre-med, first of all, I love the idea that it directly impacted people and that felt really profound to me. And I loved the certainty. I mean, I was able to put aside the fact that I got queasy at the sight of blood just because I wanted that certainty. And so I would suggest that, you know, if I were to go back and coach my younger self, it would be to live into the uncertainty while you can to experiment, to try different yeah. things and to not feel that pressure that we have to come out of universities so clear with a job. I'll tell you, I, um, I had a roommate, my roommate said to me, you know, I, Wendy, how can you not know what you're doing? You're going to like lose all these years of, of income and because you're not ready to go to grad school and immediate. And that's the greater pressure that I think we put on undergrads that doesn't yeah. give them the 
to really explore and experiment more broadly. Yeah, I feel like some of that has subsided. Um, my kids are a bit older. My youngest um, will turn 27 next week, you know, so they're largely into their career journeys. I feel like there's a lot more parental willingness, you know, to, to let kids have a bit of that time in their 20s, where certainly, you know, back, I feel like when I was, you know, in college, I, I did ROTC, so I was going into the military. So it wasn't, I didn't face that same kind of pressure that that you've described but it certainly felt like looking around at a lot of the people that I was in school with, that they did feel that pressure. And, and I, I feel like that's subsided somewhat, at least parentally. I don't know if it's subsided so much in what people, the pressure they put on themselves, you know, as, as, you know, 19 and 20 year olds. I, I hope so. I think the other trend that I'm seeing as a university professor and that I would love to figure out how to maybe reverse this a little bit is that the undergraduate majors are increasingly pre-professional and that we are um, losing sight of and losing uh, support for broader intellectual pursuits around humanities and mm. even the social sciences. And, you know, I'll tell you um, this, this pre-professional pressure several years ago, I was teaching an undergraduate class and the students really wanted to know, you know, here's the assignment. Tell me exactly what you need for me on this assignment. Do you need this question answered? Do you need that question answered? How many, what about the margins of the paper and how many words does it have to be? And it just got very specific to, to how are you going to grade this? And I was, yeah. um, so frustrated, or I had a moment of frustration that they weren't engaging with the question and content of the, the assignment. They were they were thinking about the structure and the grading of it. And I said to them in a moment of unease, I said, you know, I'm just curious here, guys. How many, if if I if you were all to give me a hundred thousand dollars, now I know it's gotten it's gone up since then, but a hundred thousand dollars and I just handed you your graduation certificate and you know you didn't have to do any work, how many of you would take that deal? And unapologetically, like 90% of the hands shot up in the room, which said to me that they were there for this instrumental need to push you know, forward. Now that might not be true everywhere. And that was a business school class. And I know that business school tends to be a little bit more pre-professional and instrumental. Yeah. But it really struck me that the idea of uh, learning for the sake of expansion, exploration, you know, I am, um, that was not what was being conveyed in that conversation. And I would like to see more of that so that we can, again, go back to this experimental value of seeing the role and value of the humanities, of philosophy, to yeah. inform science. And this, again, is a both and. The hard and the soft science is coming together. The, you know, sort of fantastical, imaginative thinking coming along with our, you know, sort of clear, logical thinking. I think we need more of that to expand our world and our next steps. And in, in, in a world where there's lots of crises that need to be solved, I think yeah. the more diversity of thought we have to solve these problems, the better off we are. Yeah, one of the consequences I, I feel you know that's come out of the the tech boom that we've had over the last twenty five years in particular, uh, you know, is is look at Harvard. I mean, I think Harvard's Harvard's uh, number one major now is computer science. I mean, fifty years ago, it would have certainly been something in the humanities, right? And so that's going on at universities, you know, all over the country in the U.S. and probably all over the world, and you know, we, we've got people who are kind of chasing more of those science-based backgrounds, right? Um, and the humanities have, have kind of been kicked to the curb to a degree. So my twins are uh, boy-girl twins, and they okay. are a little they're a little bit uh, particularly gendered in the way that they think about the world, which um, I always find fascinating about how that happens. And my son is really, we're starting the conversations about college. And my son is very interested in computer science and robotics and coding. And my daughter isn't. And she is an incredibly expansive mind who understands human interactions and is emotionally intelligent to the extreme 
And I think about their college paths and career paths where his is very clear and certain about what's possible for him and hers is not. And yet the value of what she brings to the table is more amorphous and ambiguous. But, you know, this is, I I always tell her, this is what I teach people, which is that's Mm -hmm. what's going to bring collaboration and enable us to put some of these massive challenges, bring together people who can understand different ways of thinking and solve problems. So I, you know, would love to see us value that more ambiguous kind of thinking in kids and help them to engage with that. Now, to be clear, I think girls should learn how to code and should be encouraged to code and should get over the identity that it's a boy's space. Yeah. But I also think we should value the boys and the girls that learn how to bring people together and understand the emotionally intelligent social dynamics that help people work together. You know, one of the, I guess, pitfalls of the classic college major approach is it it sends you down a particular discipline, right? And more and more, I think all along, right, the problems that we need to solve in the world and probably not just now, but going back in history are interdisciplinary in nature. And so, you know, really what you want to be teaching people is how to bring together those multiple disciplines. And yet most colleges are still kind of in the pick a major, you spend a lot of time studying that and you take some other classes as just for fun or whatever. And, you know, you don't really stitch it all together in that interdisciplinary way. Well, and this brings up a challenge if you're an HR professional in an organization. So some of the best and most creative and most effective organizations aren't out there saying, gosh, we need coding. Let's go find the computer scientist, which indeed, you know, we need those technical skills. We definitely do. They are also saying, gosh, what we need is critical thinking. And and this is on the conversation for people. We need critical thinking. We need people who could think broadly. We need emotional intelligence. So how do we find that? And this is where, you know, I really value companies like IDEO, the product development company that yeah. says, we're going to bring in biologists to study and address product design. We're going to bring in philosophers. We're going to bring in that really value those professions for, and they're not relegated to go sit on the sideline and read lots of good books and maybe write a couple of books. They're brought into the conversations and they know how to both hire for those kinds of professions and, and here's a both and here, how to bring them into the conversation so that their way of thinking is valued at the table and in the discussions as part of um, a contribution to how we solve problems, not seen as a distraction from the really hard science that we're talking about. At IDEO has always been one of my you know favorite companies. I, I just admire the heck out of what they've done over the years. And, and, you know, they were really way ahead of the rest of us in terms of bringing together a very broad range of backgrounds, right? Really embracing the idea of diversity of thought uh, and, and how people can look at a problem from different lenses and, you know, come up with a solution that's just really creative. You know, I want to go back to the emotional part because in, Sometimes I think when we talk about both anding, so again, this is a both, that diversity of thought is a both and challenge. It's how do I sit down at the table and be able to listen to somebody who has a very different way of thinking and a very different way of expressing themselves and know that there's a kernel of right in that conversation, right? So I'll go back to my husband and I, I, you know, he's a statistician. The way that he conveys and explores the world is very different from the way that I convey and explore the world. And we've had to learn how to just talk and listen to one another in ways that we can see the value of what each other has to say, because we have different ways of thinking and talking about things. So if we, if we go back to that, part of the challenge is how do we create the conditions where we can sit around the table and listen and hear different components and ideas and value those. And I think, again, there's a, there's a both and challenge and opportunity. And, you know, again, I was I, where I was starting to say was that understanding and being able to do this is also an emotional challenge because it's hard to listen to people who sound and talk and say things that are different than you because you have to listen in a different way. And sometimes it's threatening and sometimes yeah. it's, so it, there is an emotional component to that challenge. Yeah. That point you brought up earlier in our conversation about comfort 
right? Developing that that comfort with paradoxes and being able to to be okay when somebody's coming at you from an angle that may feel initially threatening and just giving yourself time to sort of calm down enough, you know, get get comfortable enough to really hear them out and understand the why, you know, behind what they're saying as opposed to just the superficial what, right? But that takes takes skill. I want to add to that. We talk about finding comfort in the discomfort and yeah. the important part of that is um sometimes the way we try and do that is to reject or or suggest you know reject the discomfort like we shouldn't feel anxious we shouldn't feel fear so we're going to turn the and actually what we say is you have to live into the discomfort like the fear or the the anxiety or the uncertainty they're all real so yeah. how do we honor that rather than try and sweep it under the rug because if it's if we sweep it under the rug all we know is that we're going to step on it and it's going to explode into a pile of dust it doesn't really go away so yeah. i think an important component in the emotional sphere is honoring the discomfort rather than rejecting it mindful of time uh you know this has been a very interesting conversation we flowed through a lot of different topics today um any last bits of advice you want to offer to our audience just in terms of how to apply this in the way that they think about their careers? Well, I'm so grateful to engage in this conversation. Um, and and maybe the last thing I'll say is, is where we were just headed, which is that I think when we talk about both anding, it can sound easy that there's just switch your mindset, switch the questions you ask from either or to both and. But it is a lifetime reminder of living into a more collaborative, less linear, more holistic, more integrative space that requires us to continually remind ourselves. And so I want to empathize with your listener as they engage in this and invite them along on a journey that I think we're all grappling with. Yes, we are definitely all grappling with it. Well, thank you. I appreciate this, especially at the very early hour of the day that it is for you. Um, I'll, I'll let you go back to your coffee. Um, <laughs> have a great day and uh, enjoy the rest of your time in Australia. Thank you so much. I want to thank Wendy for joining me today to discuss her book, Both the Unthinking, uh, her broader research, uh, and her own career journey and some of the decisions and paradoxes that she's dealt with in the course of her own career. If you're ready to take control of your career, and wrestle with some of those paradoxes, visit pathwise.io. And if you'd like more regular insights, you can become a Pathwise member. Basic membership is free. You can also sign up on the website for our newsletter and follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. Thanks. Have a great day. Thank you for listening to Career Sessions, Career Lessons. We hope the nuggets of wisdom shared today help guide your path to the successful career of your dreams. This podcast series is part of Pathwise.io, which is here to help you live the career you want. We provide a comprehensive mix of career and professional development events, insights, tools, and exercises backed by a group of leading coaches and other career management experts. If you aspire to something more or just something different in your career, join us at Pathwise.io. You can find us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. See you again on the next episode.